Hey everybody, today we are going to be making a item and equipment tier list for 1.0 update of Risk of Rain 2. I had made one previously, just, you know, a couple weeks ago, but we're going to toss that one out the window and we're going to make a brand new one. Obviously, some of the items won't be changing, but there are a majority of the items from that list that will be changing. This is because even some of the items that weren't touched, which there aren't that many that were actually changed, have been reduced in effect or increased in effect depending on some of the gameplay changes. For example, some healing items that weren't touched at all have gotten worse because the other healing items have just gotten so much better. This is going to make for a very interesting list and I'll try to explain everything as I go along. Also, someone recommended I make it so you could visualize the tier list as we go along, so I created a spreadsheet that you can check out in the description below. I'll be doing something a little bit more interesting in the future with this sheet that will be in the description below if, you know, you see this in a month or two. But for those of you who are going to be looking in the description, at the very beginning when this video is first released, there won't be anything new, it'll just be the sheet. But in the future, there will be something cool down there, so, you know, stay tuned. Alright, so let's get into the tier list, and right before we start, the structure is going to be common items, uncommon items, red items, and then we're going to go on to the equipment, lunar items, etc, etc. We're going to be ranking every item from what tier it is in. So the very start of the video, we'll start out with items in the F tier and then go all the way up until we're done with all of the items in their rarity. You'll see what I mean as the video goes on, but I just want to let you know the structure of the video. So let's actually get into it. All right, starting with D tier in the common items. First, we have the Personal Shield Generator, PSG, gain a shield equal to 8% plus 8% per stack of your maximum health and recharges outside of danger. The reason that Personal Shield Generator is in the D tier is because it affects your one-shot protection. One-shot protection is a mechanic that will prevent you from getting 100% killed from one shot. The way it does this is that if you are at 90% health or above 90% health, you cannot be killed in one frame. Because the PSG actually adds your health and affects your one-shot protection, and because shield does not work the same way as health, aka shield has to be regenerated over time, while health can be instantly regenerated with leech seeds or other various effects like medkit, makes the PSG kind of a debuff to have. Not exactly F tier because one-shot protection is a little wonky now, and getting more max health isn't bad, especially on the tankier survivors. However, I'd avoid this item if you're not going a shield build. And next up, we have Bustling Fungus, another D tier item. After standing still for 2 seconds, create a zone that heals for 4.5% plus 2.25% of your health every second to all allies within 3 meters. So basically, this item will only activate if you stand still for 2 seconds, which in Risk of Rain 2 is basically impossible. The only survivor that this item is good on is the Engineer, in which case it is actually A tier. This is because his turrets are always standing still, unless you get the meme turrets, but please don't get those. So the effect will always kind of be active. Also, Bustling Fungus is one of the weakest heals in the game now because of the new gameplay updates towards other items that buff them up to the skies. Next up in the D tier, we have Fresh Meat. Fresh Meat is kind of a terrible item now. It increases your base health regeneration by 2 HP per second for 3 seconds plus 3 seconds per stack after killing an enemy. In other words, with one stack, when you kill an enemy, you get 6 total health over the course of 3 seconds, with every stack giving you another 6 health. To me, this effect is pretty terrible considering the fact that the HP per second is so low and you cannot increase it, only increase the duration. Let's say that you have 10 fresh meat, which means that you will have a total of 2 HP per second for 30 seconds. In total, you get 60 HP out of that entire 30 seconds. Now, take the new and improved med kit for example, which after 2 seconds, you heal for 20 plus an additional 5% of your maximum health with just one stack. So you get a third of the effect immediately plus 5% which is going to be calculated based off of how tanky your survivor is in the first place. Which means that the health doesn't fall off with time which the fresh meat does. And while it is slightly more inconsistent than the fresh meat because you do have to take damage, you end up healing so much more and in a quicker amount of time. If I'm ever in a pinch and I need to heal, I can't wait 30 seconds to get 60 HP. So for this reason, the fresh meat is in the D tier and I recommend avoiding this over basically any other healing item in the game right now. Next and final D tier in the common items. We have the Focus Crystal. I've been slowly cooling on this item for a long time now because its effect is just so impractical. It increases your damage to enemies within 13 meters by 15% plus 15% per stack, making it similar to the armor piercing rounds where the active is very situational. However, unlike the armor piercing rounds, the Focus Crystal is usually only used on melee survivors and not even every single melee survivor. 
Acrid, for example, will usually never be able to use the Focus Crystal successfully since he's basically a ranged hero. Don't know why I said hero, I've been playing a lot of MOBAs lately. Also, the Focus Crystal will only increase the damage to the enemies you were within 13 meters with, so if you proc a ukulele and you're away from that 13 meters, say the ukulele procs and it's like, I don't know, 15 meters away, that damage won't actually be affected by your Focus Crystal. Because of this, the Focus Crystal essentially doesn't give you a 15% flat increase in damage and instead gives you a lot less than that because some of your items will be less effective. Plus, the fact that there's only a few melee survivors in the game and out of those, only two can use the full effect of it makes this item a D tier item. Moving on up to the C tier items, we have the bundle of fireworks. Activating an interactable launches 8 plus 4 per stack fireworks that deal 300% base damage. Now, as much as I love having a bunch of bundles of fireworks for some extra DPS while I'm going around opening certain items, the effect is rather trivial and I end up scrapping these more often than not once I see a better item. The problem is they're only going to be effective once you're opening items, so if you don't say get enough money or there's not enough shrines or you just have nothing else to do in the round, there's nothing for the bundle of fireworks to proc from, making it an essentially useless item during certain situations. That being said, it does do a decent amount of damage and does help you through the rounds, giving you some extra kills while you're trying to open chests, so I'll give it a respect C tier. Next on the C tier we have Cautious Slug which increases your base health regeneration by 4 HP per second plus 4 HP per second per stack while out of combat. Now unlike the Red Whip, the Cautious Slug will count you out of combat as long as you are not taking damage, so you can still be technically in combat while the Cautious Slug heals you up. Also, this is not in the D tier and rather in the C tier because its base health regeneration is plus four per second which is double the amount of the fresh meat and because all you have to do is avoid damage this means you can still do dps and you don't necessarily have to kill anything to increase your hp per second so all around it's a more reliable and double the effectiveness of a fresh meat which means half the time it takes to regenerate your health aka why i gave this a c tier Alright, so we got the crowbar next, which deals 150% plus 50% stack damage to enemies above 90% health. In other words, as long as the enemy is above 90% health, crowbar has an effect, and once they drop below that 90% health threshold, the crowbar becomes useless. Now, crowbar is in the C tier and not the D tier down there with the focus crystal, because this 90% health actually is something that you can work around. Burst survivors such as Loader and Artificer do really well with the crowbar, and because the new Kajaros and Renault's band proc when you do 400% damage to something, the crowbar actually is pretty helpful. I would recommend not stacking these that much because the effect is, you know, kind of useless once they go below 90% health, but if you get one, it's not the end of the world and I wouldn't scrap it immediately. Gasoline is our next C tier item, killing an enemy, ignites all enemies within 12 meters plus 4 meters per stack, enemies burn for 150% plus 75 per stack base damage. Damage. Gasoline is one of those items that's kind of nice early on in the game, but useless as you get further on in your run. For certain survivors with basically no AoE, I'm looking at you Commando, getting a gasoline in the first one or two stages is kind of a godsend. But as soon as you get a Will of the Wisp, the much better version of Gasoline, Gasoline becomes a very, very tiny percent of your overall DPS. One thing about Gasoline that has improved in the 1.0 update is that there is a new equipment that will proc your on-kill effects once you throw it. There aren't a lot of on-kill effects in the game, TBH, but Gasoline is actually pretty good with this item considering it is one of the earliest and easiest ways to get an on-kill effect. So a very tiny buff for it, but not enough to bump it into B tier. Next, let's talk about the Rusted Key, which is an item that will allow you to find a hidden catch containing an item that will appear in a random location in each stage. Increases rarity of item per stack. Rusted Key is nice for an extra item if it randomly appears before you. There is basically no point in looking for the Rusted Key hidden cache, as it just wastes your time and with a new difficulty scaling, you definitely don't want to be wasting your time looking for a white item. Also, if you have several Rusted Keys which guarantee you a rarity of an item, you'd be better off just scrapping them for like syringes or basically any other item. I wouldn't say that the item got worse with the new update, I would just say that it becomes more often than not an item that you use for scrap. Stun Grenade is an item that gives you a 5% chance plus 5% on stack chance on hit to stun enemies for 2 seconds. This has some utility in the game as stuns can prevent clay templars from completely obliterating you, it can stun beetle guards and various other forms of enemies that otherwise would shred you if they weren't stunned. However, because many survivors have stuns already in their kit, and because this doesn't do any more damage to enemies, the stun grenade is not that great. 
Completely useless though, as with multiple proc chains, you can stun several enemies, which reduces the chance that they'll be hitting you. The only problem with this item is that it does not work on bosses, and it doesn't work on certain enemies like Greater Wisp. So, that's a solid C tier for me, dog. Finally, we have the Topaz Brooch. Gain a temporary barrier on kill for 15 health, plus 15 per stack. Now, for any non-veterans of the game, Topaz Brooch used to be a god item, easily S tier in every tier list imaginable. But today, Topaz Brooch is a shell of its former self because Barrier got nerfed pretty hard. Barrier used to have its own one shot protection, essentially giving you two shot protection, but now Barrier is not calculated at all. This means it basically just gives you a bit of extra health. So when you gain a temporary barrier on kill for 15 health, it's the same as essentially getting plus 15 extra health for a couple seconds. It's a pretty weak effect, but it's nice early game and even later on in the game to get you just a little bit of extra health, but it's nothing to write home about. Okay, now let's go into the B tier for the common items. Starting off, let's go with Energy Drink, which sprint speed is improved by 30% plus 20% per stack. Now, Energy Drinks are pretty much inferior to Goat Hoofs in every single way, as I'm pretty sure that after the first stack, the Energy Drink is less effective than Apal's Goat Hoof, even when sprinting. That doesn't mean it's useless, however, as the extra mobility it gives is really nice, especially since all survivors sprint. Also, if anyone didn't notice this from the patch notes, mobility skills are now considered sprinting, scaling with sprint speed multipliers and also sprinting after use. This means mobility skills are now buffed with sprinting effects. So all of your survivors with mobility skills, rip the engineer, artificer, and captain, now get extra benefit from the energy drink. Because of this, and because the effect wasn't bad to begin with, I'm going to give this a solid B tier. Next up we have Sticky Bombs, which is one of my favorite items to go on the new captain. A 5% plus 5% chance on hit to attach a bomb to an enemy detonating for 180% total damage. Now, I'm in love with total damage. If you've ever watched any of my videos, I've probably mentioned that total damage is just amazing in Risk of Rain 2, so I shouldn't really have to give you too much of an explanation for Sticky Bomb, but I think at every point in the game, you should at least have one Sticky Bomb. They are incredibly easy to find, have a good proc chance once you stack enough of them, and are a nice little end to a proc chain. And now we have the new and improved War Banner. What the War Banner does is that once you level up or start the teleporter event, it will drop a banner that will strengthen all allies within 60 meters plus 8 meters per stack, raise attack and movement speed by 30%. Now the war banner got buffed in the newest update, its values didn't change at all, but now once you start the teleporter event, it drops a banner. This means that unlike before, you will actually be able to benefit from the war banner basically every stage. Previously, there was no guaranteed way of dropping a banner other than leveling up, and no one ever pays attention to that, so it would just randomly drop across the stage. Now you actually drop a banner around the teleporter or wherever you're standing when the teleporter activates, which gives you a better chance of being able to actually use your war banner. The attack and movement speed is pretty good as it's a free double soldier syringe and an energy drink. So solid B tier now that there is a guaranteed way of being able to use your war banner. Alright, let's move on to the A tier, and there are a couple of new items in this list, and we'll start out with the Med Kit. The Med Kit's effect is 2 seconds after getting hurt, heal for 20 plus an additional 5% plus 5% per stack of maximum health. Previously, this had no effect on your maximum health, and would only give you a base value plus stacking value. I'm gonna be honest, I can't remember what the old values were, but they were pretty low, so over time, the Med Kit would get worse and worse. Now, with the additional 5% of your maximum health plus 5% per stack, Medkit is actually very reliable later on in the game. I won't be able to give this an S tier because you still have to get hit and it's not exactly 100% reliable, but it's better in the late game and super good in the early game as well. It stays and maintains its viability throughout the game. Next, we have Monster Tooth, which got buffed similarly to the Medkit. Killing an enemy spawns a healing orb that heals for 8 plus an additional 2% plus 2% per stack of maximum health. Unlike before, where it healed for 8 plus 8 per stack. Now, much like the medkit, this will maintain its viability throughout the entire game. However, its effect is still somewhat inconsistent as you still have to walk over the healing orbs to actually get the benefit. So, not quite S tier, but we're going to keep it at the A tier because it's a super good item early game and super good item late game. Now, let's talk about the Repulsion Armor Plate, which reduces all incoming damage by 5 plus 5 per stack. Repulsion Armor is the poor man's tougher times. You may not be able to have enough tougher times to block 100% of the damage, but you can have enough repulsion armor plates to block most of all of that damage. 
Plus, the Repulsion Armor Plate will reduce all incoming damage, which means this will actually block environmental damage, which is in the new update. They actually buffed it like that. And it will also block any DOT damage, such as Fire Elites or Bleeds, which makes it really nice because these DOTs get their effect reduced each time and makes the Repulsion Armor Plate an A tier item. Next, we have the Soldier Syringe, which is A tier, increases attack speed by 50%, plus 15% per stack. Lovely item to get, and because of the new 3D printers, it's a lot more common, which makes it really good. The only problem with Soldier Syringe is that there are other items that give you much more attack speed. For example, War Banner gives you two Soldier Syringes, but the benefit of the Soldier Syringe is it increases your attack speed by 15% all the time. It's a consistent effect that happens the entire time you have it. I personally put this at A tier, but I can see how some people might put it at S tier. Next, we have the Armor Piercing Rounds, which is surprisingly in the same tier as Soldier Syringe. This is, this is weird. So Armor Piercing Rounds deal an additional 20% damage to bosses plus 20% per stack. I think of this as just an upgraded version of the Focus Crystal, where you do extra damage to a certain extent. The Focus Crystal only doing that damage when you are in melee range, and the Armor Piercing Rounds only dealing this damage to bosses. However, two things changed in this update that make the armor piercing rounds much better than they were previously. First, we have an endgame boss that is just very difficult to defeat, and if you stack a lot of armor piercing rounds, he becomes much simpler to do. Because much like the allied warship unit, armor piercing rounds work on this final boss. Also, the difficulty scaling of the game has increased, which makes the game harder if you take too much time. This makes killing the teleporter boss a little bit more important than it was before, and the teleporter bosses are much stronger than they were before. So having a bunch of armor piercing rounds is actually pretty good now and I would not scrap these items if I got them. Next we have the backup magazine which gives you an additional charge of your secondary skill for every stack of backup mag you have. This is exceptional for certain survivors like the Huntress, Mercenary, and Artificer. It's also good for other survivors, Commando for example is also extremely good with the backup magazine. However for other survivors like the Engineer and Loader and Rex for example, the backup magazine doesn't do a whole lot for them. It is a nice benefit for every survivor, even the captain who has one of the worst M2s in the game, but for certain survivors, they are going to prioritize this item over others. All right, now let's get into the S tier. This is the last tier for the common items. First up, you probably already know what it is. Lensmaker's Glasses is S tier. With every stack of Lensmaker's Glasses, you have a 10% chance to critically strike, which deals double damage. I want to point out real quick that the 10% chance is not affected by your proc chance or your proc coefficient. So regardless of whether or not you have a 1.0 proc coefficient or a 0.1 proc coefficient, it will always be a 10% chance to crit. And then with every stack, you'll get an additional 10%. So this means that you will max out at 10 stacks of Lensmaker's Glasses, giving you a 100% crit. All right, so there's that. Now, other things about the Lensmaker's Glasses that you need to understand is that the Lensmaker's Glasses have been buffed. This is because there's a new item in the game called the Shatter Spleen, which makes having crit give you a bunch of new effects. We'll be getting into that once we get to the boss items, but I just want to let you know that the Lensmaker's Glasses are even better than they are before, or were before. Just remember that having over 10 does nothing for you, as 10 caps your max critical strike chance. I mean, once you have 100% of something, you can't have more of it. And there are two other items in the game that give you a hidden 5% chance. For example, the Harvester Scythe, it gives you a hidden 5%. So in reality, you shouldn't stack more than 9. Don't try to scrap your glasses, however, as the scrapper will take all of your glasses at once, taking all of your crit chance away, which is a big mistake. So try your best to never get above 10. All right, next up, we have Tougher Times, the best item in the game for defensive capabilities. Tougher Times gives you a 15% plus 15% per stack chance to block incoming damage which is unaffected by luck. This means that not only will 57 Leaf Clover not affect the chance for this, but also the new item which gives you negative luck will not affect this as well. So to anyone who was always complaining about the Tougher Times not being affected by luck, I bet you're really liking that it's not luck affected now, huh? Anyways, Tougher Times is also hyperbolic, which means that the 15% is not actually accurate, so you won't get 30% from two Tougher Times. In fact, you're not even getting 15% from the first Tougher Times either. And for every stack of Tougher Times, the next stack is less effective. So, for example, on the first Tougher Times you get, you get 13%, the second one 23%, 3 31%, and it decreases further from there. So, on the first Tougher Times that you got, you got a 13% chance, on the second one you got an increase of 10%, and then on the third one you got an increase of 8%. 
if that helps you visualize how the tougher times decreases over time. Also, because it's hyperbolic, you will never reach 100% block no matter how many you get. So usually most players just go to 10, which gives you a round 60% chance to block damage. So just keep that in your mind whenever you're stacking tougher times, 10 means 60%. Next, we have the Paul's Go Tooth, aka the Better Energy Drink, which increases your movement speed by 14 plus 14% 14 per stack. This movement speed increase increases all of your movement from walking to sprinting meaning that the Goat Hoof will always have an active effect on you and because of the new buff to mobility skills, Goat Hoof is even better now. And for the last S tier on the list, one of the brand new S tier items because of this new update, we have the Tri-Tip Dagger. The Tri-Tip Dagger is absolutely insane now because of the bleed changes. You have a 15% plus 15% per stack chance to bleed an enemy for 240% base damage. Because of the new changes to bleeds, which allows infinite bleeds and for bleeds to refresh all existing bleed durations on that target, Tri-Tip Dagger is an insane item. Having one is good enough, but once you finally get the 100% chance to bleed, you're absolutely going to shred almost every enemy in the game. The damage isn't that high and it's based off your base damage, which is not very high at all, which is one of the reasons why I put a solo in my last tier list, but when you can proc something infinitely, it makes it a lot better. So, the Tri-Tip Dagger finally made its way into the S tier. Alright, now let's go into the uncommon slash green items. Starting with D tier, we have Squid Polyp. Not much has changed from this item, activating an interactable summons a squid turret that attacks nearby enemies at 100%, plus 100% per stack attack speed lasts 30 seconds. Like I said, nothing has changed for this item, it's still just as bad as it was before, the turrets are really useless, and just scrap this for some green scrap. Leptin Daisy is still D tier, release a healing nova during the teleporter event, healing all nearby allies for 50% of their maximum health, occurs 1 plus 1 per stack times. This is one of the most inconsistent forms of healing in the game, and you need to be inside the teleporter for it to work. Definitely a D tier item if I've ever seen one. Moving on to the C tier items, we have the first one which is Chrono Bobble. Chrono Bobble slows enemies on hit for 60% movement speed for 2 seconds plus 2 seconds per stack. While this item in itself is pretty bad, because of the fact that the death mark is super good, and because most survivors don't have enough debuffs to get the death mark by themselves, Chrono Bobble is just good enough because it allows you to get the death mark. Next we have the Gore's Tome, which is 4% plus 4% on stack, chance on kill to drop a treasure worth 25 gold, scales over time. The Gore's Tome is another item that's kind of okay to have, you always need money, but it's not really that tremendously good. Later in the game you will notice that you have an abundance of wealth, so you don't really need the Gore's Tome, and I'm pretty lazy so I don't like picking up things. But you know, if you feel like you need more gold, the Gore's Tome is good, and if you don't, you can always scrap it for green scrap, so C tier item. Next we have Leeching Seed, damaging enemies, heals you for 1 plus 1 per stack health. The Leeching Seed is C because of the low amount of heal it gives you. I mean you need 8 for it to heal as much as a Harvester Scythe would heal you, but it's an okay item if you have no other forms of heal, which is just rare now. One thing to note is that it is really good on the captain because he shoots 8 pellets and each pellet gives you a leeching seed proc, which means the leeching seed will give you 8 health per hit with your M1. Still, not the greatest as the harvester scythe is just better and if you have crits, which hopefully you do, it's always going to be superior to the leeching seed. Alright, next up we have the red whip, which leaving combat boosts your movement speed by 30% plus 30% per stack. Much like the Leeching Seed, the Red Whip is a lackluster item because there are better items that do the exact same thing. It's nice if you have no other mobility yet, but if you do, it's not really that great. And last on the C tier, we have the Warhorn, which activating your equipment gives you 70% attack speed for 8 seconds plus 4 seconds per stack. The effect is actually pretty powerful, I mean 70% attack speed is really good, that is a lot of soldier syringes just to get you to that attack speed. However, like many other items of its kind, this effect is inconsistent. First off, you need an equipment, which in some cases can take several stages for you to even acquire. And not every equipment is going to have a short enough cooldown for this effect to be meaningful, looking at you prey on with your 140 second base cooldown, and also certain items like the eccentric base are going to be used when you're not exactly in combat. Because of this, I'm sticking the Warhorn down here in the C tier. Alright, next up, let's go to the B tier and start with the Berserker's Pauldron. Killing three enemies within one second sends you into a frenzy for six seconds. Increases movement speed by 50% and attack speed by 100%. The effect is super good, I mean 100% attack speed, I can't complain about that, and all you have to do is kill three enemies. 
earlier on this is a little bit more difficult to do and later on it is still kind of hard to do but there's always going to be some trash mobs looking at you wisp that will be around for you to kill next we have the bandolier which is an 18 percent plus 10 percent per stack chance on kill to drop an ammo pack this ammo pack will reset all your skill cooldowns now this is pretty nice but much like monster teeth and the gore's tome it drops at the enemy's feet and will despawn very quickly this means if you're not ready for the pack to drop, it could despawn and you won't be able to get its effect. And also, you're not always going to be close enough to the enemies to even be able to pick up the bandolier in the first place. Plus, the bandolier will not reset all of your skill cooldowns like it says. If you have a charge-based skill, like the Engineer's Turrets for example, it will only do one of those charges. Also, if you have multiple backup magazines, it will do the same thing. It will count as one single charge towards your backup mag. So while the bandolier is a pretty good item, it is not essential considering you won't always be able to get the effect. Next we have the infusion. Killing an enemy increases your health permanently by 1 plus 1 per stack up to a maximum of 100 plus 100 per stack. This means that if you pick up one infusion and kill 100 enemies, you will gain 100 health, with you gaining 1 health per enemy killed. Picking up 2 will give you another 2 health per enemy plus up to 200 maximum health. While the item's effect is kind of okay, I mean getting more maximum health is pretty nice I suppose. For certain survivors, say the Huntress or Mercenary, who recently had his maximum health nerfed, the infusion will provide a decent amount of maximum health towards them. However, Risk of Rain 2 isn't really about tanking up as towards the end of the game or towards the end of your runs, usually you're about to get one shot. These enemies are doing thousands of damage, so increasing your health by 100 is not really that important in the grand scheme of things. Also, before we move on, I want to mention two things about the infusion. One, the effect of the transfusion will be doubled if you pick up a transcendence, which doubles your health but turns it into shield. So picking up a transcendence will give you 200 health from one single infusion. Inversely, picking up a shaped glass will actually have the amount the infusion gives you. So if you have one shaped glass and one infusion, the infusion will only give you 50 health. Keep this in mind whenever you're stacking shaped glass or if you're going for the transcendence build, which is kind of weird, but you know, I respect it. All right, next up, and this is the last B tier, we have the Rose Buckler, which increases your armor by 25 plus 25 per stack while sprinting. The reason that I put the Rose Buckler in the B tier is because although armor is good, most survivors can't actually attack while sprinting, which means that the Rose Buckler effect won't always be active. Plus, as I was talking about with the infusion, although armor is good as it blocks a percentage of the damage, the later in the game it goes, the less your damage reduction is going to be doing. Early on, you want to rely on repulsion armors and things like that to prevent a lot of damage coming through to you, but as it goes later, you're going to be relying more on tougher times to block the damage entirely, as certain enemies go from doing about 50 damage to several hundreds of damage. If you're a squishy survivor like Huntress, having something reduced by 50% of a thousand is still basically your entire health pool. So although the Rose Buckler is good and it reduces damage, the later it goes, the less reducing damage is going to do. You'd rather be avoiding damage altogether. Alright, now let's get into the A tier items. First up, we have the Death Mark. The Death Mark, enemies with 4 or more debuffs are marked for death, increasing damage taken by 50% from all sources for 7 seconds, plus a couple extra seconds per stack. This 50% damage buff is pretty good, however they changed it, it used to be 50% plus 50% per stack, although this was technically bugged. I say that in quotes because they changed it from doing the damage increase per stack to now seconds per stack. So it turns out it wasn't actually bugged, Hapu just never intended for the 50% plus 50% per stack to ever exist in the first place. But regardless, the death mark is still a good item as increasing damage taken by 50% is pretty insane. It's one of the highest in the game and is even better than Shattering Justice when it comes to actually dealing more damage to enemies. The main caveat to this whole thing is that you have to have enemies with 4 or more debuffs. Now most survivors in the game have 0 debuffs, and those that do have debuffs only have 1 debuff. For example, Rex has Weakens and Acrid has Poison, but that still leaves 3 debuffs for them to collect before Deathmark will even have an effect. Because of this, I'm just going to put Deathmark in the A tier, even though it is an extremely good item with a very strong effect, it's just that you have to build up to it over time. And it makes you hold certain items, like the Chrono Bobble, even though you would usually want to scrap them. So in a way, it gives Chrono Bobble and some other pretty bad items a purpose, but it is pretty annoying when you get this early on and you don't have enough debuffs for the death mark to even work. Next we have the Harvester Scythe, gain 5% critical strike chance one time only and critical strikes heal for 8 plus 4 per stack health. 
This means that every single time you hit an enemy and crit them, you will gain 8 health. This item is absolutely bonkers on the captain because if you crit with your M1, every single one of your pellets will crit. And because of this, every single pellet will be healing you for 8. And because there's 8 pellets, that means 64 health per crit. I don't think I mentioned that in my previous captain guide, but I'm mentioning it now, so there you go. This is one of the healing items that are pretty much mandatory as you have full control over how much you heal with it, and it gives you 8 times the heal that Leeching Seed does, with the one caveat being that you need to have critical strikes. And unlike other items on this tier list, it actually gives you 5% critical strike chance, which allows you to use the item even if you have no crits when you get the item. Maybe you can learn from this, Deathmark. Moving on, we have the Hapu Feather, which is A tier, gain 1 plus 1 per sec maximum jump count. Although the effect seems pretty lackluster, only getting a 1 jump per stack, this is actually insane as you can mainly avoid anything on the ground once you get a single Hapu Feather. Mobility is king in Risk of Rain 2, so most mobility items are going to be going up to the A tier, except you Red Whip, you suck. You can also use the Hapu Feather to avoid fall damage even when you jump off of the map. The way you do this is right before you're about to hit the ground, or in the case of the map, right as soon as you're about to be teleported back onto the map, all you have to do is use your Hapu Feather and jump right before you hit the ground, and all of the fall damage will be negated. So, quick little tip there for anyone who didn't know. Moving on, we have Kajaro and Renald's Band. I'm going to both be giving these the same tier, because, I mean, they're basically the same item now. Hits that deal more than 400% damage also blast enemies with a runic flame tornado, dealing 300% plus 300% per stack total damage over time. This effect recharges every 10 seconds. In other words, most of your skills or abilities won't be able to proc the Kajaro's band like they used to. Instead, you will only be able to proc Kajaro's and Renault's once you do a mega ton of damage. So, for example, if you were the Artificer, your M1 wouldn't be able to proc the Kajaro's Band, but your Charged Nanosphere or your Charged Nano Bomb will be able to. And because both bands actually do total damage, this is actually a good thing, as instead of proccing on your little itty bitty tiny hits, you will only be proccing the Kajaro's and Renault's on massive hits that do 300% of that total damage. So, at minimum, you're always going to be doing 1200% damage with the Kajaro's or Renault's. If you have big boy damage, like for example the captain and his orbital probes, which deal 1500% damage, the Kajaros will proc on that and deal 300% of that 1500% damage, which is absolutely insane. I feel like the Kajaros band are better now, because you can always guarantee when you're going to proc Kajaros or Renaults, and they always do a massive amount of damage. The 10 second cooldown makes sense balance wise, however, later on in the game this gets weaker and weaker, as it will only be active every 10 seconds. So, all around good item and insane DPS, especially early on, you can just shred bosses with this, but it feels a little less powerful than the old Kajaros did in the later game. Next up is the Old War Stealth Kit, which gives you a chance on taking damage to gain 40% movement speed and invisibility for 3 seconds plus 1.5 seconds per stack. This chance also increases the more damage you take. The Old War Stealth Kit is a unique item, it kind of saves you in a lot of circumstances. For example, if you're ever being hit by a Titan Beam, the Old War Stealth Kit can proc during any of the Beam DPS hits, and once you finally do go invisible, the Titan Beam will stop. So it's definitely a good item, especially if you have a shield build, as the seconds that you get invisible are seconds you're probably not going to be able to be hit unless for whatever reason you decided to stand and fire. So if you're running a shield build, the Old War Stealth Kit is super good. But much like other items I've critiqued on this list, your goal is to avoid damage altogether, especially the later on it goes. The Old War Stealth Kit is good, but it's not good enough to save you from a big fat titan beam one-shotting your face off. Next up we have Predatory Instincts. Much like the Harvester Scythe, this will give you a 5% critical chance, one time only, and will increase your attack speed by 12% for every time you critically strike, up to a maximum of 36 plus 24% per stack. In other words, the more you crit, the faster you hit. The more critical strike you have, the better this item is, as it essentially gives you a free soldier syringe once you have enough crit chance. Very simple item, very simple effect. I love it. A tier. Now for one of my favorite items in the game, we have Razor Wire. Getting hit causes you to explode in a burst of razors dealing 160% damage, hits up to 5 plus 2 per stack targets in a 25 meter plus 10 meter per stack radius. 
Razor Wire, in my mind, is an improved version of the ukulele. The one caveat being is that you have to get hit for it to actually proc. It has a proc coefficient of 0.5, so that means for every single enemy it hits, it has a 0.5 chance of proccing your other items, much like the ukulele, just with a better proc coefficient, and actually hits more enemies than the ukulele. One of the best use cases for the razor wire is getting a Hellfire Tincture, which is a lunar equipment which deals damage to you, which will proc the razor wire. This means you'll be constantly using the razor wire without really having to do anything yourself. Taking fall damage also gives you razor wire procs, and I suppose if you're truly insane, if you turn the artifact which allows you to have friendly fire on, getting hit by your allies will also proc razor wire. An A tier item in general, but once you pair it with the Hellfire Tincture and a bunch of on-hit effects, the Razor Wire becomes super powerful, so A tier. Next up, we have the Wax Quail, jumping while sprinting, boosts you forward by 10 meters plus 10 meters per stack. Wax Quail is my favorite mobility item in the game. It allows you to dodge a whole bunch of things, including basically every form of Titan Beam. Picking up a single Wax Quail on survivors that have no mobility whatsoever will just improve the game immediately. It is not the best mobility item in the game, however, because of certain things, like for example, stacking multiple Wax Quails is actually not a good thing. You only want to stack one, max two, or else you'll be jumping way too far and won't be able to control yourself. But I could argue it is one of the best mobility items in the game as you only need one stack for it to be at its basically maximum effectiveness. The one problem being is that the more you stack it, the worse it gets, so it could go either way. Either way, it's an A tier item and I recommend you only get one or you'll kind of screw yourself. Finally, on the A tier for the uncommon items, we have the Will of the Wisp. On killing an enemy, spawn a Lava Pillar in a 12 meter plus 2.4 meter per stack radius for 350% plus 280% base damage. This is the gasoline on crack and is the better version of it in every single way and is the best on kill AoE effect in the game. Plus, because of the new equipment which allows you to have on kill effects whenever you throw it, the Will of the Wisp slightly got a buff. For certain survivors that have single target damage but no AoE, Will of the Wisp is perfect as you can kill one enemy and kill a chain of them. Plus, the explosion of the Will of the Wisp has a 1.0 proc coefficient which means it can proc other items. And boy do I love proc chains. Okay. Okay, now let's go on to the S tier for the uncommon items. Starting out, we have the ATG missile, which if you've ever watched any of my videos, you know what I feel about this item. The ATG missile has a 10% chance to fire a missile that deals 300% plus 300% per stack damage. This is total damage, which means if you do 1000 damage in one hit, the ATG will proc, giving you 300% of that 1000 damage. And unlike Kajaros and Rinalds, this is a proc chance on every single hit, which means you will be able to hit a bunch of these depending on how quick you attack. If you have high enough attack speed, this can essentially be an AoE item since you're going to be constantly proccing the missiles, and the ATG missile itself has a proc chance of 1. Definitely deserving of the S tier ranking that I'm giving it. Next we have the fuel cell which allows you to hold an additional equipment charge plus 1 per stack, reduces equipment cooldown by 15% plus 15% per stack. The cooldown reduction actually stacks exponentially which means it will reduce effectiveness over time the more stacks you have of it, but you will always be able to have plus 1 per stack with every single fuel cell that doesn't get reduced effectiveness. This item is in the S tier because there are certain equipment like the Royal Capacitor and the Preon, which are absolutely insane and can carry you through a run with just the equipment. At the point in the game where you have like 10 fuel cells and a Royal Capacitor, it doesn't really matter what survivor you are as you just won the game of Risk of Rain 2. Pair this with a Gesture of the Drowned and your runs just become insanely easy, you don't even have to press buttons anymore. While yes, you do have to have an equipment for this to be effective at all, the chances of you going an entire game without an equipment is pretty astronomically low. So, solid S tier on the fuel cell. For the next S tier, we actually have the old guillotine. The old guillotine recently got a nerf, it will instantly kill elite monsters below 13% plus 13% per stack health whereas it used to be 20% plus 20% per stack. This is because they recently changed a bunch of elites and changed the health of certain enemies, so if they didn't retune the guillotine, it would have been even more overpowered than it already was. One thing to note about the old guillotine is it is hyperbolic much like the tougher times, which again means that its effectiveness over time decreases as you stack more of them and you can never reach 100% execute threshold. So you can't stack like 10 guillotines and instantly kill elites, instead you'll be stacking more like 1000 and still won't be able to one-shot elites. This item is S tier because as the game progresses there will be more and more elite monsters and even the teleporter bosses will start to become elite enemies. 
these elite enemies have exponentially more health and damage than their counterparts. So not having a guillotine kind of gibbs you. Also because they recently upped the difficulty scaling by 10% on every single difficulty, the elite monsters will start coming much, much sooner. So having several stacks of guillotine is a must if you want to survive these stages now. And for the final S tier, we have the ukulele. The ukulele will give you a 25% chance on hit to fire chain lightning for 80% total damage on up to 3 plus 2 per stack targets within 20 meters plus 2 meters per stack. The ukulele is probably the best AoE item in the game and is the source of many many proc chains. The ukulele does total damage which again I'm completely in love with although it's only 80% so it's actually reduced effectiveness over time. The ukulele also has a 0.2 proc coefficient which means every tendril of lightning will have a 0.2 chance of proccing your items. For those of you who don't really understand proc coefficients, it's essentially if a item has a proc coefficient or if your attacks have a proc coefficient, you take the 1.0 or 0.2 for example of the ukulele and then you multiply that by the percent chance of something to occur. So you would take the ukulele's 0.2 multiplied by the 10% of the ATG and that is the chance that you will have of the ukulele proccing the ATG. Hopefully that helps you understand what I'm talking about. Anyway, the ukulele is one of the best items in the game, especially when it comes to AoEing down enemies. If you are a survivor that lacks AoE, I recommend stacking as many as these as possible. Okay, so now we are finally in the red items. Red items are legendary items and they are the rarest items in the game to get outside of boss items. So we're going to start with the D tier of the red items. First off, we have the Happiest Mass, which killing enemies has a 7% chance to spawn a ghost of the killed enemy with 1500% damage, lasts 30 seconds, plus 30 seconds per stack. So the problem with the Happiest Mask is not really its effect, but rather the AI in the game just being wonky and not being really helpful in general. If you have a Happiest Mask, really all it's going to do is tank your FPS once you get enough kills, and sometimes the AI can still kill you even though they are procced on the Happiest Mask. For example, the Clay Dune Strider Suck Attack will go off when you have them under the Happiest Mask, and this Suck Attack actually deals damage to you, which can kill you. So probably one of the worst items to get when it comes to legendary items. And that was actually the only D tier item in the entire legendary list, so let's go straight to B tier. Starting out, we'll talk about the Aegis. The Aegis Healing Pass Full carries you a temporary barrier of 50% plus 50% per stack of the amount you healed. So essentially, overhealing will give you barrier. The problem that I explained with the Topaz Brooch is barrier isn't really that good, plus Aegis requires you to have some form of healing that will allow you to heal Pass Full. Regeneration doesn't count, Fresh Meat doesn't count, Cautious Slug doesn't count, so all of these things don't count towards the Aegis's overhealing. Instead, you need to have an item like Bustling Fungus, Leeching Seed, Harvester Scythe, things like that that will increase your health. If you have none of those items, getting this legendary item will be completely useless. Because of that, I give it a B tier because it is a strong item, granted that you have those items set up. Next up, we have the Frost Relic, which killing an enemy surrounds you with an Ice Storm that deals 600% damage per second. The storm grows with every kill, increasing its radius by 1 meter, stacks up to 6 meters plus 6 meters per stack. Now, this item has similar problems to the Focus Crystal, in which you need to be basically in melee range for this effect to even benefit you. However, unlike the Focus Crystal, the Frost Relic actually does an insane amount of damage, 600% damage, and that's per second. If you're a melee survivor, this item is really good as you're always going to be in melee range if you are like the Mercenary, the Loader and Acrid don't really benefit from it as much, but if you switch to their melee modes, I suppose, then the Frost Relic is super good on both of them. Also, the Frost Relic can help you clear some trash mobs. For example, if you jump in the air a little bit, you got a Hopu Feather, you got something that can give you a little bit of verticality, you can kill Wisp super easily with this. But to be honest, it's really not that great of a legendary item. I don't want to put it down in C tier because it does do a lot of damage and I have used it to great effect before, but you know, you don't really want to be in melee range that often. So I'm just going to slap this in B tier and call it a day. The next B tier item is the H3AD 5TV2. I just call it the head stat. I don't ask me why. It increases your jump height and creates a 5 meter to 100 meter radius kinetic explosion on hitting the ground, dealing 1000 to 10,000 percent base damage that scales up with speed, recharges in 10 minus 50 percent per stack seconds. This item recently got buffed in the new 1.0 update. Basically, when you're falling, the speed you are falling at will increase the radius and the damage you do. This makes the head stat an actually really good item, especially with Kajaro's or Renal. I dare put this in A tier, but I'm going to sit it here in B tier right now. Because it is pretty quirky to use, you need to fall quickly, which is really weird. I mean, that's kind of a waste of time just jumping and trying to fall quickly. 
but it does give you a bunch of damage and increases your verticality, which in Risk of Rain 2 is really good. Also, hidden effect that it doesn't tell you is it removes fall damage entirely, so basically, if you're not loader, this item will be very helpful. So yeah, we're gonna stick it here in B tier. I think it's really good and could borderline be A tier, but for now, B tier. Now we have the Interstellar Desk Plant. One of the worst legendary items previously is now not a bad item anymore. What the IDS does is on kill, plant a healing fruit seed that grows into a plant after 5 seconds. After this 5 seconds, the plant heals for 10% of maximum health every second to allies within 5 meters, plus 5 meters per stack, and it lasts for 10 seconds. I think this used to be inferior to the bustling fungus in just about every single way. For starters, it takes 5 seconds for the plant to even grow, whereas the bustling fungus only takes 2 seconds. However, now it heals 10% of your maximum health every second. A drastic improvement over what it used to be, I think it used to be 5%, so double that. And also, the radius is 5 meters, which used to be 2.5, I believe, and increases by 5 meters per stack. I used to just groan every time I saw the IDS as it was plain bad, but now that it has this basically doubled effectiveness, it isn't that bad. It's a B tier item. It's a free bustling fungus every time you kill something. So I guess you can value it if you really need healing. You don't really need healing later on in the game, but it's not terrible now. It's not completely useless. Finally, we have Wake of Vultures, which is B tier, gain the power of any killed elite monsters for 8 seconds, plus 5 seconds per stack. Wake of Vultures has always kind of been underwhelming as elites really aren't that powerful, their effects aren't at least, which makes it so once you finally have this proc and you're an elite monster for 8 seconds, you kind of go whoop de doo I can light things on fire I guess. The duration is incredibly low, only 8 seconds for one stack and then plus 5 for every stack subsequently. Very underwhelming, if it gave you even a portion of the stats that elite monsters have, this item would be much much stronger, but it doesn't so it sits here in the B tier. Okay, let's go on. On up to the A tier. Starting us off, we have Brain Stocks. Upon killing an elite monster, enter a frenzy for 4 seconds plus 4 seconds per stack, where skills have no cooldown. This is extremely good on certain survivors like the Huntress. Huntress lives for Brain Stocks, as killing an elite monster will allow her to use all of her skills indefinitely for 4 seconds. The one thing about Brain Stocks that you need to understand is that there is a global cooldown where essentially you can't spam all of your skills like within a one second window a million times. There is like a slight one second cooldown for most skills that prevents you from just spamming them like crazy. But Brain Stocks is still a really good item and it sits here in the 8. Next up we have Alien Head which reduces skill cooldowns by 25% plus 25% per stack. This is exponential which means that you can't just get 4 and have 100% cooldowns on all of your stacks and instead once you pick up the second one, you have a drastically decreased effect in this, much like some other items I've talked about. The thing about Alien Head is that the survivor skills are already on a pretty low cooldown, so decreasing it by 25% really isn't that major. But it's still good because you still want to be spamming your spells as much as you can. I wouldn't consider it an S tier item because S tier items are like, Oh my god, guys, look at this, I got blank item. And Alien Head really doesn't feel like it. It's like, oh, my skills are cooling down quicker. Cool. So I'm just going to give it an A tier because very nice effect, very simple effect, but it's not like overwhelmingly powerful. Okay, so we have the Dio's best friend, which is A tier on the engineer and B tier on everyone else. I didn't want to mention it in the B tier, like down there with everyone else, because then I'd have to be like, oh, it's A tier on engineer and you guys would have been underwhelmed by its effect. But let me explain its effect on the engineer real quick. So what Dio's best friend does is upon death, this item will be consumed and you will return to life with three seconds of invulnerability. So in other words, you get an extra life. This item is kind of crap on other survivors as you'd rather have something that would help you survive rather than an item that just gives you an extra life. I mean, if you died before, why wouldn't you die again, right? But on the engineer, his engineer turrets actually get Dio's best friends. This means that every time a turret dies, it will respawn and it will actually not affect the engineer's Dio's best friend. This is because the engineer's turrets items are independent of the engineer himself, so they don't actually use his Dio's when they die. So for every Dio's you have, that's how many extra lives your turrets will have. It's a pretty nifty little trick with the engineer, but the item's not really that good as it just gives you an extra life. Try to avoid dying in the first place. Next we have the Resonance Disc, which charges by killing enemies, then fires automatically dealing 300% plus 300 per stack in a line, explodes for 1000% plus 1000 per stack damage, and returns dealing 300% plus 300 per stack damage in a line. Basically everything this item does is big damage, and it is big good. 
the way this item works is you kill a couple enemies and then the residence disc will go off and kill a bunch of others. When it launches itself and then when it returns, it has a proc coefficient of 1, but the explosion, which does 1000% base damage, actually has no proc coefficient, so it won't proc any items. I really can't say too much about this item other than herder damage, so A tier, herder damage. Alright, now let's move on to the S tier for the red items, which is like the large majority of all of the legendary items. So for starters, we're going to start with the best item in the game, 57 Leaf Clover. The 57 Leaf Clover allows you to roll all random effects plus 1 per stack times for a favorable outcome. This means every time you go to proc an item and you don't, the 57 Leaf Clover will try to roll it again to try and get that item to proc. Also, the 57 Leaf Clover is trying to prevent you from getting debuffed, which means if a Fire Elite hits you, the 57 Leaf Clover will try to roll to make sure that you don't get lit on fire. Having a single 57 Leaf Clover will be exceptional for your proc chain and make it seem like basically all of your items are procking all of the time. A lot of people will say, you know, 57 Leaf Clover isn't that good because you need other items for it to be a good item. But I'd love to see a game where people get 57 Leaf Clovers regularly before they get other items in the game. That's just not how legendary items work. So S plus for the 57 Leaf Clover, which is the best item in the game. Next is the Brilliant Behemoth. All your attacks explode in a 4 meter plus 1.5 meter per stack radius for a bonus 60% damage to nearby enemies. This means that every single attack that you have, from your utility to your M1 to your M2, it doesn't matter, every single ability will actually proc the Brilliant Behemoth, as long as it is an attack. The Captain's M1, which shoots many pellets, will actually proc the Brilliant Behemoth on every single pellet, which is super cool. The only problem with the Brilliant Behemoth is that it does not have a proc coefficient, meaning it will not proc other items. Also, it stacks pretty poorly, so getting multiple stacks of the Brilliant Behemoth is not really that good as the 1.5 meter per stack is pretty lackluster. That being said, it is one of the better AoE items in the game and increases your DPS by 60% immediately. The next S tier on the list is the Ceremonial Dagger, which killing an enemy fires out three homing daggers that deal 150% plus 150% per stack base damage. The daggers have a proc coefficient of 1, which means they will proc on hit items a bunch, and can chain and start killing the entire map if you're strong enough at that time. The Ceremonial Dagger is probably where most of my god runs come from, as as soon as you get this and a couple other items, the game kind of runs on autopilot. A Gesture of the Drowned and a Disposable Missile Launcher with a couple of fuel cells and a Ceremonial dagger basically means I don't have to press any buttons and the entire map just dies. But even if you don't have that setup, just killing enemies, which is something you do passively, will create three daggers which do a bunch of damage and continue your proc chain. Easily an S tier item. Next is the hard light afterburner which adds 2 plus 2 per stack charges of your utility skill and reduces your utility skill cooldown by 33%. Obviously, some utility skills are better than others, for example, the Commandos is pretty lackluster, all it is is a slide, which, you know, isn't really that good once you add more stacks to it, but does increase your mobility, so it isn't terrible, whereas the Engineer can have 100% uptime on his bubble shield once he has one hard light afterburner. Relatively straightforward item, and it's just a really good item in general, so S tier. Rejuvenation Rack is the next S tier item, heal plus 100% plus 100% per stack more. In other words, it doubles your healing every time you get a stack of Rejuvenation Rack. So, for example, if you have one Rejuve Rack, you get double healing. If you get two, you get 200% healing, then 300%, then 400%, etc, etc. It's a linear stack. Unlike a whole bunch of other items in this game, this will actually double your regeneration. So, for example, if you have fresh meat or a cautious slug, anything like that, it will double your regeneration. The real reason that the Rejuvenation Rack is such a good item is it buffs so many other items you probably already have. Kind of similar to how the 57 Leaf Clover works. Next is the Sentient Meat Hook, which gives you a 20% plus 20% per stack chance on hit to fire homing hooks at up to 10 plus 5 per stack enemies for a 100% damage. This is total damage, much like the ukulele, however, it does a 100% total damage. In just about every stat, the Sentient Meat Hook outperforms the ukulele, and each hook has a proc coefficient of 0.33, so there is a pretty good chance that your 10 hooks are going to proc something. If you see this in a cauldron and you're a survivor that has basically no AoE abilities, again, I'm looking at you, Commando, I would trade every single one of my green items for a sentient meat hook. 
Okay, next we have the Shattering Justice, which is S tier. After hitting an enemy five times, reduce their armor by 60 for 8 seconds, plus 8 per stack. Minus 60 armor gives you about 37% bonus damage to whatever enemy you're hitting. So it does have less damage than a death mark. However, all you have to do is put five hits on an enemy and you will put this effect on them. Next is the Soulbound Catalyst, which reduces equipment cooldowns by four seconds, plus two seconds per stack every time you kill an enemy. Since most equipment does damage, you're probably going to be getting this a lot. You get a Gesture of the Drowned, you get a Royal Capacitor, and boom, you're set. You're basically Zeus from now on. If you ever get blessed enough to have Soulbound Catalyst and Ceremonial Daggers, plus Royal Capacitor slash Disposal Missile Launcher, and boom, that's a god run. Between this and Ceremonial Daggers, these are probably my favorite items to see drop from a Legendary Chest, and if I see it in a cauldron, I'd probably give my life for it. Okay, the final S tier red item in the game is the Unstable Tesla Coil. Fire out lightning that hits 3 plus 3 per stack enemies for 200% base damage every 0.5 seconds. The Tesla Coil switches off every 10 seconds. The Tesla Coil has a proc coefficient of 0.3 which means it has a third of the chance that a 1.0 proc coefficient would have and is one of the better AoE items in the game. I should probably stop saying this for every single AoE item but there's just a lot of them, you know? This one is more or less turn your brain off as you don't have to do anything, you could just AFK and you know, every 10 seconds the unstable Tesla coil is gonna wipe the map for you. Stay solid and keep S tier. And I think that's it for the legendary items, now we get to go on to boss items, aka the yellow items. Starting out with the D tier, we have the Queen's Gland. Every 30 seconds, summon a beetle guard with bonus 300% damage and 100% health can have up to 1 plus 1 per stack guards at a time. Simply put, in Risk of Rain 2, anytime you have AI characters that are on your side, they're usually gonna be not very useful. Sometimes they get stuck in certain areas, sometimes they just completely fall off the map repeatedly, and even when the beetle guards finally get to the enemies, they're not gonna be doing a tremendous amount of damage. The main problem with yellow items like this where they are not very good is that these contest directly for teleporter green items. So for every Queen's Gland that you end up picking up, you could be losing out on an ATG, a ukulele, or any other green item. So I'm going to put the Queen's Gland down at D because the damage that it deals is pretty low. Even when it finally does do that damage, they get lost all the time. And the AI in Risk of Rain 2 is just not that useful when it's on your team. Next up we have the Genesis Loop. Falling below 25% health causes you to explode, dealing 6,000% base damage, recharges every 30 seconds with a minus 50% per stack cooldown reduction. Now, when I first saw this item, I thought it was completely insanely broken because, you know, 6,000% damage in an AoE is massive. It is huge. However, the sad part of the story is you have to fall below 25% health. Now, other than taking fall damage repeatedly, there is no reliable way to fall below 25% health that wouldn't probably kill you. So, even though this effect is really powerful, you're probably not going to be able to use it all that much. Also, in the event that it actually procs normally, so when you're getting hit by enemies, usually you're trying to take cover immediately, so you're not going to be able to hit as many enemies as you could if you were, say, full health. The item is much better on the Engineer, and I guess you could make an argument for Rex, considering he can lower his health below 25% health, but in a game of Risk of Rain 2, where a stray wisp shot can basically kill you from 25% health, it's probably best to not be at 25% health in the first place. Alright, so those were the only two D tier items in this list, so let's go on to the C tier items. So starting us out, we have the Pearl, which increases maximum health by 10% plus 10% per stack. Technically, this isn't really a boss item as it doesn't drop from bosses, but I am going to consider it a boss item because you can actually trade it in for other boss items. So if you get to a boss item printer and you have a Pearl, then it counts. So anyway, going back to why this is a C tier item is the effect is pretty weak. It increases your maximum health by 10%, but this isn't really that good for most survivors. Even for the most tanky insane survivors, you could be looking at like 100 health, which is one infusion. And to get the pearl, you have to trade in a lunar item at one of these cleansing pools. That being said, the only time that you're probably ever going to get the pearl or attempt to get the pearl is when you have a lunar item that you would rather get rid of. So I'm going to put it in C tier because, you know, the effect's okay, but it's not great. And the last C tier in the boss items is the Halcyon Seed. I think it's Halcyon. People have been making fun of me recently, saying that I don't know how to pronounce things, so I'm kind of, you know, a little worried. Anyway, the Halcyon Seed is Summon Aurelianite during the Teleporter event. It has a 100% plus 50% per stack damage and 100% plus 100% stack health. Now, you get one of these by defeating Aurelianite in his gold teleporter area. 
so it's rather a rare item. However, its effect is pretty weak. It's just basically an upgraded beetle guard. Also, Aurelianite only spawns during the teleporter event, so the effect is only during the teleporter event. I'm going to be giving it a C because the effect isn't terrible. I mean, having an extra hand during teleporter events is pretty nice, but he doesn't do very much damage and he's not very useful. So we're slapping him down here in the C tier. All right, let's move up to the B tier. There is only one item in the B tier, and this item is the Titanic Neural, which you get from the Stone Titan. The Titanic Neural increases your maximum health by 40 plus 40 per stack and base health regeneration by 1.6 HP per second and 1.6 HP per second per stack. So this has 40% of the effectiveness of an infusion and half of the effectiveness of a cautious slug. It's certainly not a bad item as its effect helps your survivability, especially in the early game of Risk of Rain 2 where there's basically no health regeneration. But due to power creep in this game, this is getting worse and worse with every patch as the new health items are getting buffed. Who cares about a titanic neural when you could just get a med kit that will heal like twice as much as this? The one bonus to this is that you have to do nothing for your base health regeneration to increase. For example, the Cautious Slug has 4 HP regeneration per second, but you have to be out of combat and not taking damage. The Titanic Neural doesn't care if you have taken damage recently or not, it just heals you passively. So Titanic Neural is B tier because early in the game it's okay, but the later it goes you're probably going to regret seeing this. Okay, let's move on to the A tier boss slash yellow items. First up, we have the Mired Urn, which is a brand spanking new item that comes from the Clay Dune Strider. While in combat, the nearest 1 plus 1 per stack characters to you within 13 meters will be tethered to you, dealing 100% damage per second, applying tar, and healing you for 100% of the damage dealt. So, it's basically a mini suck attack from the Clay Dune Strider, and it will increase the amount of characters that can be pulled into you per stack. I'm going to be calling the Mired Urn a single player only A tier item and a multiplayer F tier item. Also, I'm going to also be calling it an F tier item if you're playing the Engineer. This is because the effect does not care whether you are friend or foe, and it will suck any nearby characters as long as you're in combat. So, for multiplayer, this means that any players that you're playing with, if you are in combat, you will start sucking sucking them and dealing damage to them. What this means for the engineer is that if any of your turrets are in combat, they'll start sucking you. I should probably stop saying sucking, but I'm going to keep going with that terminology. So yeah, the mired urn is actually a negative effect if you're an engineer or you're playing with multiple players as it can kill you. I remember when I first got the item, I thought it was really cool up until the time that the engineer turret that I had recently placed down ended up killing me. But if you're any other survivor in the game, mired urn is really powerful. It's one of the only items in the game that calculates your damage for its healing, the other one being equipment that we'll be getting to later but it is pretty insane when it comes to healing and one of the best boss items when it comes to healing so eat your heart out titanic neural a mired urn next up we have the molten perforator which is dropped from the magma worm 10% chance on hit to call for 3 magma walls from an enemy dealing 300% plus 300% stack damage each. Does this item sound familiar at all? I hope it does because it's basically just an ATG. The difference between this and an ATG is that the 3 magma balls are more than the 1 rocket that you shoot, however they do not seek and they kind of randomly hit things around them. This makes the Molten Perforator better than the ATG in AoE scenarios, but it is worse in about every way to the ATG in single target scenarios. Still a strong item and really good for any survivor that likes on hits. I'm looking at you, Captain. Next up, let's talk about the Little Disciple, which has recently got a buff. I guess technically a minor nerf, but a buff later on in the game. The Little Disciple drops from the Grove Tender boss and fires a Tracking Wisp for 300% plus 300 per stack damage. Fires every 1.6 seconds while sprinting. Fire rate increases with movement speed. That last part being added with the new buffs. So the fire rate on this item actually got nerfed during this patch. However, it actually increase with more movement speed, which means it scales. And in Risk of Rain 2, where every run is supposed to go over 30 minutes, you know, new players check out a beginner's guide or something, <laughs> scaling is always going to be superior than just having a flat increase. So because of this new buff and because that movement skills have been buffed as well, I'm going to call the Little Disciple a A tier boss item. Especially on Huntress who can sprint while shooting, which increases her DPS dramatically. Once she gets a little disciple. And that's it for the A tier items. Let's now move on to the S tier items, and these are gonna be hot. First up, we have the Shatter Spleen, which is a new item that drops from the Imp Overlords. What this item does is it makes critical strikes bleed enemies for 240% base damage. Bleeding enemies explode on death for 400% plus 400% damage. 
plus an additional 15% plus 15% per stack of their maximum health. Now, this item is pretty much insane in just about every scenario. Essentially, what it does is it makes it so that if you do have enough critical strike chance, you now have bleed, which is single target, and you now have an explosion, which is AoE. But that's not the only thing that's pretty powerful about the Shatter Spleen. The Shatter Spleen actually has bleed independent of the tri-tip dagger. This means that you can be applying double bleed on every hit with enough critical strikes and enough tri-tip daggers. Plus, the item scales with the enemies, which are always scaling. Their maximum health is always going to be increasing as difficulty goes on, so this means that the Shatter Spleen is always going to do a tremendous amount of AoE damage. I dare say Shatter Spleen is one of the best items in the game right now, and definitely one of the best on-hit items, period. It does so much with so little, the only downside being that it's a rare boss drop from an Imp Overlord. So its S tier ranking is definitely deserved. The final S tier item on the list is the Irradiant Pearl. The Irradiant Pearl is just like the Pearl in which you need a cleansing pool to actually acquire it. But again, it counts as a boss item. So if you go to a 3D printer, you'll be able to use the Irradiant Pearl. So I'm considering it a boss item. What this Pearl does, it increases all stats by 10% plus 10% per stack. It's a really simple effect, but a really powerful effect as this increases your base damage, your health, attack speed, everything. It's a mini spinal tonic that has no negative effect tied to it so it's just an S tier item as it increases all of your stats with no downside. The one thing about the Iridium Pearl is that it has a low drop rate. I think it's like 4% from a cleansing pool which in itself is already rare. I've personally never seen an Iridium Pearl drop so you could say it's a pretty rare item. Okay so that's it for boss items let's move on to lunar items. These items have tremendously powerful effects normally and usually have big downsides tied to them. Starting up with the F tier we have Corpse Blue. Heal plus 100% plus 100% per stack more. All healing is applied over time. Can heal for a maximum of 10% reduced by 50% per stack of your health per second. The reason that this is F tier is basically because it's a rejuve rack, except it doesn't actually double your health regeneration from certain items or just your base health regeneration. So it's actually a worse rejuve rack. But also it will put a cap on how much you can heal per second, with more stacks making this item progressively worse and worse. One of the main reasons I put fresh meat so low was because the heal over time is not very good in a game where you need the heal like right now, which is the main reason I'm going to be putting corpse bloom so low, so low as they are in the F tier. One may not be the end of the world, however picking up more than one will basically ruin your run if you have any healing items at all. But that is the only F tier item in this list, so let's move on to the D tier lunar items. First up on the D tier, we have the Brittle Crown, which gains you a 30% chance on hit to gain 2 plus 2 per stack gold, scales over time, lose gold on taking damage equal to 100% plus 100% per stack of the maximum HP percentage you lost. To make this as simple as possible, when you get hit, lose money, when you hit other things, gain money. Brittle Crown is another one of these lunar items you probably want to avoid picking up, as the earlier in the game, you get it it will seem more valuable but the later on it goes it's going to lose its value the reason for this being at the very beginning of the game you usually don't have very much money since not a lot of things are spawning also there's very low risk involved in you actually getting hit so the brittle crown at this point in the game seems pretty freaking good however the truth is as the game goes on further and further more things are going to be accidentally hitting you and at a certain point there's going to be so many things for you to kill that you'll have an excess of gold so the brittle crown falls off pretty hard almost as soon as you get to stage three because at that point most things are going to be spawning at a quick enough rate that you're going to be able to get money to open chests any extra gold is usually pretty useless and you're going to be losing it anyway as soon as you take a single hit one thing to note about the brittle crown is that the engineer turrets actually have their own copies of the brittle crown and give no gold to the engineer once they hit things thankfully this means that once they get hit they won't lose gold for the engineer regrettably this means that one of your most reliable ways of hitting things is now completely gone I'm going to be putting Brittle Crown in the D tier because it's not that terrible of an item and it's okay early game if you need some extra gold real quick. Plus, cleansing pools exist so you can always drop off the Brittle Crown in the Lunar Coin trash can. In exchange for either a Pearl or an Iridium Pearl, either way, it's a net positive. Next up, there is Strides of Heresy, which replaces your utility skill with Shadow Fade. Fade away, becoming intangible and gaining plus 30% movement speed, heal 
for 25% plus 25% per stack of your maximum health. Last 3 plus 3 per stack seconds. The reason Strikes of Heresy is a D tier is because it is good on some survivors and butt trash on certain others. Now, it's not exactly F tier as the effect is somewhat powerful. It's a slight mobility buff and it gives you some form of health regeneration that most survivors don't have. Survivors like Commando and Rex who have some pretty not fantastic utility skills can be using this Shadow Fade. However, for some other survivors such as Huntress or Engineer or Captain, this will probably be more of a detriment than anything else. So here are survivors that I believe are okay with getting Shreds of Heresy. Acrid, Engineer, Huntress, Commando, Rex, Multi. Survivors that getting a Shreds of Heresy is a complete throw is Artificer, Captain, Loader, Mercenary. Again, because the effect isn't really that bad, I can't put it in F tier, but you would prefer to keep your base utility skill over Shreds of Heresy in most of these scenarios. Next we have Transcendence, which is a D tier item. It converts all but one health into regenerating shields. Gain 50% plus 25% per stack, maximum health. There are many things wrong with Transcendence as an item. The main one being is it is a tank item, which means its effectiveness is only on certain survivors. Also, because Risk of Rain 2 is a scaling game, enemies will eventually catch up to the insane amount of health you'll get even if you stack multiple Transcendences. And last but not least, Transcendence is really bad because it converts all of your health but one HP, which effectively makes it useless, into a regenerating shield. I've already explained a little about PSG, so you should already know what I'm talking about if you watched that part of the video. But essentially, shields do not work as regular HP and you can't gain it back in the normal way. This means leeching seeds, rejuvenation racks, and even the other lunar item, Corpse Bloom, will not affect your HP regeneration when it comes to shields. The only thing that will allow you to regenerate your shields is time. After a set amount of time, your shields will begin regenerating all the way back up to full. The problem with this is, is that you have to be undamaged the entire time while you are waiting for your shields to regenerate. That means if you're lit on fire by a fire DOT, there is nothing you can do but hope that the fire DOT doesn't kill you. Also, this means if you have any healing items in general, so for example if you had a med kit, cautious slug, or leeching seed, any of these items, they will no longer work with your shields, effectively making them useless. In the case of the med kit and the leeching seed, they are completely and utterly useless and should only be scrapped at this point. So while other items boost the effectiveness of other items, for example the 57 leaf clover will boost the effectiveness of basically every item with a percent chance, Transcendence nerfs a majority of them. That being said, there is a use case for Transcendence. If you have enough stealth kits, if you go invisible, you will be able to regenerate all of your health before you actually end up coming out of the invisibility. So if your plan is stacking multiple PSGs, multiple stealth kits, and multiple Transcendences, that is indeed a viable build. But because the build is so specific and other items are rendered completely useless, I have to put this in the D tier. Next up, we have Visions of Heresy, which replaces your primary skill with Hunger and Gaze, Fire a Flurry of Tracking Shards that detonate after a delay, dealing 120% base damage, holds up to 12 charges, plus 12 per stack, then reload after 2 seconds, plus 2 per stack. I regularly call this the needle gun because it looks just like the needle gun from Halo, and it is indeed one of the worst M1s in the game, sadly. The problem with Visions of Heresy is that most survivors have their M1 skills as their best abilities. Captain, for instance, his M1 is literally the best M1 in the game, and if you ever get Visions of Heresy on him, I will find you, I will hunt you down, and I will make you put it in a cleansing pool. That's not to say that Visions of Heresy isn't viable on some survivors, it's just on most survivors, it's complete and utter trash. For example, when you were playing non-melee Acrid, which is just about every game you play as Acrid, Visions of Heresy is pretty viable as you can swap out your melee attack with an attack that actually does something. Sadly, they recently buffed Acrid's M1 and did nothing to Visions of Heresy, so one of the only viable people to actually pick up Visions of Heresy is now maybe gone. One of the main problems with Visions of Heresy is the the fact that it actually holds charges which means you have to reload and the reload increases with every stack that you pick up. The first stack being 2 seconds, the second stack being 4 seconds, and the third stack being 6 seconds to reload. Although you do gain more charges per stack, the reload time is pretty killer. This essentially caps your max attack speed because no matter how fast you attack, eventually you'll have to reload and that reload can take anywhere from 2 to 6 seconds. So if you're a survivor with basically 0.0 reliance on your M1, you can pick this up. However, 
even then it's still probably not the best item so that's it for the d tier and i have no items in the c tier so we're skipping directly to the b tier in the b tier we have focus conversions teleporters charge 30 percent plus 30 percent per stack faster but the size of the teleport zone is decreased by 50 percent minus 50 percent per stack smaller in other words the teleporter size is small small and you charge the teleporter fast fast some people really like this item i find the item to be quite annoying and not as good as i initially thought it to be the main problem with focus conversions is that you charge the teleporter faster yes however the teleporter size gets smaller and smaller and becomes almost impossible to stand in once you're fighting the boss if nobody noticed magma worms and overloading worms got a massive massive huge large buff in this patch that essentially makes them a threat now that they can finally be able to face bunch you so if you're ever faced with magma worms or overloading worms good luck standing in that tiny 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 teleport zone and that's not to mention that most other teleporter bosses are going to kick you out of the teleporter zone anyway and at that point it doesn't really matter how fast you charge it because you're not charging it when you're running outside of it this means that on paper you're saving time doing this as the teleporter will charge faster once you're in it you're going to find it increasingly difficult to stay in it once the bosses get harder the enemies get harder and the teleporter zone shrinks also know that stacking focus convergence past the third stack will do absolutely nothing although i'd hate to see what focus convergence would look like if it was stacking past three so those are my main complaints about the focus convergence but here are the actual numbers behind it the base time it takes to charge the teleporter zone is 90 seconds meaning if you stand in the teleporter zone for 90 seconds it will be at 100 percent charge with one focus convergence this turns into 69.2 seconds which is a negative 20.8 second change or in other words it would be as if you were charging it to 76.8 percent with two focus convergences, the charge time would be 56.2. That's a negative 13 second change between 1 and 2. And in total, the difference between the overall charge time would be 23.8 seconds. This means you're essentially charging the teleporter to 62.4% when you're charging the teleporter with two focus convergences. And finally, with three, you have 47.3 second charge time and a negative 8.9 second change between the last one. So in total, the changes would be 42.7 seconds shaved off from the teleporter charge time. Or percent wise, it would be as if you were charging the teleporter to 52.5%. As you can notice with the percentages, you lose effectiveness over time. The first one giving you a minus 20.8 second change, the second one a minus 13 second, and the third one doing minus 8.9 second. In my opinion, it's always best to have one focus convergence as it is the most effective and the zone size is reduced the least. The zone is still manageable, but you still take 20 seconds off of the total time it takes to charge the teleporter if you do go down the route of picking up three focus convergences you only have about 42.7 seconds of being outside of the teleporter zone before you are wasting the effectiveness of the focus convergence so experiment with it yourself and if you feel like you're spending more than 50 seconds outside of the charged teleporter zone probably put away the focus convergence as it's just not really that great of an item however i will put it in the b tier as it does quicken teleporter events and i think at least one stack of it is pretty good obviously if you you have a god run and you just want to quickly go to the next stage several times then you could have three if you want but i like to stick with one next up we have shape glass in the b tier there's a reason this is in the b tier now shape glass increases your base damage by 100 percent plus 100 percent per stack but reduces maximum health by 50 percent plus 50 percent per stack shape glass has always been one of the best items in risk of rain 2 because it increases your base damage by an insane amount and by the way the increase to your damage is actually exponential meaning that if you have 200 percent damage and then get another shape glass you have 400 percent damage if you have just four shape glass you are doing 1600 percent damage from your base 100 percent that is an insane increase and although you're at 6.25 percent health you are just one shotting everything at this point this is something that's always been really strong in Risk of Rain 2, and finally in the 1.0 update, Hapu finally changed something. So previously, no matter how much you stack shaped glass, you would always have one shot protection on. So if you could keep your health above 90%, you could never be one shot by anything. That means even if you had 10 health, all you had to do was keep your health above 9, and you'd be good. But now, as of the 1.0 update, if you have a curse on you, which shaped glass or tonic or any other form of curse, that takes away at least 10% of your health, one shot protection is just disabled on you so even picking up one shape glass will disable one shot protection and you're free game for the rest of the risk of rain 2 monsters out there 
This essentially makes you what shaped glass was supposed to be in the first place, a glass cannon. Now, because I don't think it's a complete deterrent yet, I'm going to be putting it in the B tier, but in the future, if some things change, maybe it goes up in rank, maybe it goes down in rank, but for now, shaped glass is kind of risky. Not quite the item it used to, but I'm sure there's going to be a cheese stack that get it back on the meta. All right, so that's it for B tier. Let's skip straight to S tier because there's no A tier items in the lunar items. The one and only S tier item that is a lunar is the gesture of the drowned. The Gesture of the Drowned will reduce equipment cooldown by 50% plus 15% per stack, forces your equipment to activate whenever it is off cooldown. Basically how a Gesture of the Drowned works is whenever your item is off cooldown, it just uses it, regardless of what item it is. There are certain items the Gesture of the Drowned will not use, for example Royal Capacitor needs a target before it can be used, but as soon as you hover over a target, Gesture of the Drowned will be using your Royal Capacitor. Also, if you're multi and you can switch between your two equipments, it won't use the equipment which you currently don't have equipped. That being said, that equipment will still fully appreciate the 50% cooldown reduction from the Gesture of the Drowned. Now, I probably shouldn't have to explain to you why Gesture of the Drowned is so good. I mean, you saw reduce equipment cooldown by 50%, but I'll do a little bit anyway. So, equipment in Risk of Rain 2 is usually pretty powerful. We have the Pran Accumulator, which does a billion damage, the Rogue Capacitor, which does a little bit less damage, but has a much lower cooldown, and we even have things like the Disposable Missile Launcher, which just seek out targets, and it's basically a free fireworks. Being able to reduce the cooldown by 50%, even though it forces you to use it, is definitely an easy trade-off to make. I mean, it's basically a double benefit, as I have less Carpal Tunnel because I don't have to press my Equipment button. I mean, Gesture of the Drown is one of the legendary hands-off keyboard items in Risk of Rain 2, where you literally don't have to do anything once you get set up. Pair the Gesture of the Drown with a couple of Fuel Cells, which have the cooldown reduction as well, and a strong equipment, let's say a Royal Capacitor or a Disposable Missile Launcher, and you basically have one of the best setups in the game. Previously, you would pair this with a Shaped Glass, and you'd just be able to wipe the map as soon as you spawn in, but, you know, Shaped Glass is slightly nerfed. Also, if you ever pair Gesture of the Drown with Soulbound Catalyst and a Damage Equipment, you're basically off to the races. Imagine a Disposable Missile Launcher with a 10 second cooldown that essentially will refresh itself every time it kills something. Or a Royal Capacitor where you basically freeze your game with the power of Zeus as you look at everything and it gets lightning bolted. So Gesture of the Drown S tier and that's the last item on the Lunar Items. Now a little post edit here, I absolutely forgot that there are three new Lunar Items in the game, so I'm going to interject real quick and do these. First up we have the Defiant Gouge, which is a B tier item. Using a Shrine summons enemies stronger per stack nearby and scales over time. In the simplest form, all this is is a free combat shrine anytime you hit any other shrine. Early on this could be an easy source of gold, but can quickly spiral out of control if you don't use it carefully. And once it gets to the later game, you're basically going to be summoning loads and loads of bosses every time you hit a single shrine. You're less likely to start hitting Shrines of Chances all willy-nilly once two or three Stone Titans start spawning on them. Probably want to ditch this item the later it goes in the game, so if you find a Lunar Cleansing Pool, probably drop this in there. Solid item, but it can't get out of hand quickly, so B tier. The next new Lunar item is the Mercurial Reikis. Creates a Ward of Power in a random location nearby that buffs both enemies and allies within 60 meters plus 50% per stack, causing them to deal plus 50% damage. While the effect is nice, the plus 50% damage is the same amount of damage as a Death mark however it also buffs the enemies around the aoe so while you have a chance to basically empower yourself you can also empower other enemies this gives the item a little bit of inherent risk and could create a scenario where you're basically buffing the enemy and not yourself so i'm going to give this a b tier and finally we have the purity which is an f tier item all skill cooldowns are reduced by two plus one per stack seconds all random effects are rolled by plus one plus one per stack times for an unfavorable outcome this is essentially the anti 57 leaf clover except you also get your cooldowns reduced by two i'm fairly confident most of you will understand why this is just a bad item i mean i called the 57 leaf clover the best item in the game and this is essentially the anti version of this so it must be one of the worst items in the game i mean out of all the survivors in the game there are very little that rely directly on their skills rather than their items the only one that maybe could get away with this is the artificer but even then you still don't want this item in a game where your power essentially correlates to how many items you have reducing the effectiveness of every item in your inventory is kind of a weird move. I'm sure that this is actually viable if you go like a skill cooldown build, 
maybe a hard light afterburner and some alien heads, a backup magazine or two thrown in there. But other than that, I can't see how this would ever be a good item to have. I will be moving on to equipment and we'll be including all of the lunar equipment and the other equipment. We'll talk about those later. First up, let's start with the D tier equipment and we'll be going off with the blast shower. The blast shower will cleanse all negative effects, including debuffs, damage over time, and nearby projectiles. Now, personally, I hate the blast shower and won't pick it up even if I have no equipment on me. This is just because I hate the item, not because the item sucks. I mean, it's in the D tier, so it does kind of suck, but it still has its uses. For example, it can cleanse off any DOT that includes bleed, fire, or even the um, malachite. So yeah, there you go, person who made fun of me. It's malachite. I pronounced it right this time. Although, interestingly enough, the Kajaro's and Renault's cooldown counts as a debuff, so you can use this and refresh the debuff on both of those items. Pretty nifty use, not really that useful since hopefully you will replace the Blast Shower by the time you get a Kisharos or a Rinald's, but you know, it could come in handy. Next up, we have the Eccentric Vase, which creates a quantum tunnel up to a thousand meters in length and lasts for 30 seconds. This has an equipment cooldown of 45 seconds and is one of the worst equipment to get. This is because while you're in the quantum tunnel, you can still be hit, and if you shoot out of the quantum tunnel too fast, you can take fall damage. And while this would be pretty useful on some mobility survivors, for example, if you're just like Commando and you need to get to a high location and you can't really jump to it, you can use your eccentric vase to get up there. But on other survivors that already have the mobility required to get there, it's not going to be useful at all. So we're going to stick it here in the D tier. Next up, we have the Radar Scanner, which reveals all interactables within a 500 meter radius for 10 seconds. This, much like the Eccentric Vase, has a 45 second cooldown and a lackluster effect. Sure, you can spot out interactables, but you never know what the interactables are. They could be chests, they could be shrines, they could be anything. Because of this, you could end up going to one part of the map thinking you're about to get a chest, and in reality, all you're going to see is like a blood shrine. Even worse is if you find a drone and you have no intention of ever picking up that drone. When using a radar scanner, I like to live by the rule of pop it and drop it, where you pick it up and then drop it immediately after using it. D tier for the radar scanner for not being completely useless, but being something that I don't want the effect of for a long period of time. Next we have the backup, which allows you to call 4 strike drones to fight for you and last for 25 seconds with a 100 second cooldown. Now if you've watched the whole thing, which kudos to you, this is a very long video, you will know that AI in Risk of Rain 2 completely sucks, so these 4 strike drones are probably not going to be that useful. They also don't last very long, the 25 seconds being pretty short, and the damage they do is pretty lackluster as well. Pair this with a 100 second cooldown, which means there's like a 75 second downtime, and you've got a D tier item. Next we have the Crowd Funder, which fires a continuous barrage that deals 100% damage per bullet, costs 1 gold per bullet, and costs increase over time. Basically you're trading money for damage, but not a whole lot of damage. If you've ever thought that burning your money wasn't enough, you can pick up the crowdfunder for kind of lackluster damage unless you have a bunch of other on-hit effects. Even then, you're probably not going to be doing any tremendous damage. And that being said, you can make the crowdfunder self-sustaining while holding two brittle crowns as long as you don't get hit. And also, if you use this with the Gesture of the Drowned, it will always be on, which means you can't buy anything else. So if you ever have a Gesture of the Drowned, make sure you never walk over the Crowdfunder or you won't be able to buy anything. If you have a Gesture of the Drowned, this is an F tier item, so avoid it at all costs. Alright, let's move on to the C tier items. Starting us out, we have the Ocular HUD, which gains you a 100% critical strike chance for 8 seconds. The reason I say that Ocular HUD is pretty low on the list, even though it gives you a 100% critical strike chance, is because you can't go over 100% critical strike chance, so once you finally do reach that point, the Ocular HUD becomes useless. Anytime before then, the Ocular HUD is a pretty good item, but even then there are still better equipment out there. Next up is the Primordial Cube, which fires a black hole that draws enemies within 30 meters into its center and lasts for 10 seconds seconds. This black hole will affect basically every enemy in the game except bosses, which is a major downfall to the item itself. The main reason that this is C tier is because the primordial cube does not affect bosses, and also if you are a survivor with no AoE, the black hole isn't really going to help you at all. That being said, if you're like an artificer who can wall off all the enemies and execute them immediately, this black hole is going to be pretty pog. But even then, much like the Ocular HUD, there are still better items that you can get in your equipment slot. Next up is the Samarang, throw 3 large saw blades that slice through enemies for 3 times 400% damage, also deals an additional 3 times 100% damage per second while bleeding enemies, can strike enemies on the way back. Samarang has a 45 second cooldown and is pretty lackluster in its damage capabilities. It's not bad and it's nice to have a middling damage item in the game, however the large cooldown on it makes it 
lackluster. To put it in perspective, the Royal Capacitor has 3000% damage and a 20 second cooldown, while the Sawmering has 1200% damage if you hit every saw, which is really hard on a single target, which means it lacks 1800% damage and also has 25 seconds of longer cooldown. You might think that because Bleed was buffed that the Sawmering would be better, but really the only reason Bleed was buffed is because you can proc it infinitely and Sawmering can't do that with a 45 second cooldown. So anyway, you look at it, the Sawmering is inferior to basically every other damage equipment in the game and has too long of a cooldown to be effective. Finally, we have the Volcanic Egg, which turns you into a Draconic Fireball for 5 seconds, deals 500% damage on impact, detonates at the end for 800% damage. Volcanic Egg has a 30 second cooldown and is a pretty decent item, I would say. While Volcanic Egg is technically a damage item, I consider it more of a mobility item. Once you turn into the little fireball, you can essentially fly around the map, albeit a little bit slowly, but it allows you to go around the map in places you usually wouldn't be able to go. Plus, if you're a survivor that struggles with killing Wisp, you could always just kill the Wisp with the Volcanic Egg. Not a bad equipment, just kind of outclassed by some of the better equipment slots. I know I said the final item, but I forgot to mention Milky Chrysalis, which is another C tier item. Sprout wings and fly for 15 seconds and gain plus 20% movement speed for the duration. Milky Chrysalis recently got a buff that allows you to actually fly instead of just being weird low gravity. And now you get a little dash forward with the Milky Chrysalis. So with the Milky Chrysalis you might be able to dodge a couple of abilities that you otherwise wouldn't have been able to. Definitely a good item on survivors with low mobility like Engineer or Multi. But other than that, probably gets replaced by other better equipment. Alright, so that was the final one for the C tier, now let's go on to the B tier. And actually, before I continue on, I just want to say that unlike other items in the game, which get rankings like A tier, B tier, whatever, based off of the fact that they're just good items in general, equipment slots are pretty rare. That means you only have one equipment that you can put in a slot at once. This essentially means that every other equipment is competing against other equipment for that exact same slot. RNG dictates a lot, but you're going to have a lot of choices in the game. So when I say the Sawmering is good, but it gets outclassed, that means that you will probably be replacing it later on. It's not like the Chrono Bobble where the item is basically poop, but you carry it around anyway because, you know, there's no point in not. With equipment, you actually have to choose. I just wanted to bring that up real quick so everyone knew what I was talking about. Let's now get into the B tier equipment. The first B tier equipment we're going to be looking at is Forgive Me Please. Forgive Me Please throws out a cursed doll that triggers any on kill effects you have for every 1 second for 8 seconds. When it says it triggers your on kill effects, it literally means every single on kill effect there is. So if for example you have a topaz brooch which on kill gives you 15 barrier, every time the Forgive Me Please is proccing so every 1 second you will get 15 barrier from the topaz brooch. If you have a will of the wisp, the will of the wisp will spawn on the the Cursed Doll. There are in total 17 on kill effect items in Risk of Rain 2, one being unused and at least one not working with the Forgive Me Please. The one that doesn't work being Soulbound Catalyst as that was a broken infinite loop of equipment. The only problem I have with Forgive Me Please is that it requires you to have one of these on kill effects for it to even work. If you have Forgive Me Please but zero on kill effects, you'll just throw out a doll that literally does nothing. So I'm going to be giving this a B tier, although I do feel that it is pretty powerful once you get enough on kills. Next up we have the Gnarled Wood Sprite. Gain a Wood Sprite follower that heals you for 1.5% of your maximum health per second can be sent to an ally to heal them for 10% of their maximum health. This has a 15 second cooldown. Gnarled Wood Sprite is extremely good early game and can even go late game because it does it based off of your maximum health. This means regardless of how much health that you have at the time, it will be healing you for 1.5% of it, or if you want to use it on yourself, which you can use the ally heal on yourself if you're playing solo, you'll be able to gain 10% of your maximum health instantly. If you're having trouble sustaining or you don't have any healing items yet, the Gnarled Wood Sprite could be a good alternative. Next is Gorag's Opus. All allies enter a frenzy for 7 seconds, increases movement speed by 50% and attack speed by 100% on a 45 second cooldown. Gorax is pretty nice, especially when paired with something like Warhorn, which increases your attack speed by 70% after your equipment is applied, as you'll have your attack speed boosted by an insane amount. There is, however, a bug with Gorax, which prevents the captain from using it, which is just weird, and I have no idea why that is. So, if you're the captain, this is an F tier item on everyone else. It is a B tier item. The Jade Elephant is a B tier item, which allows you to gain 500 armor for 5 seconds on a 45 second cooldown. 500 armor equating to 83.3% damage reduction. 
So for that 5 seconds, you are almost invulnerable. This item can really help you in a pinch if for example you're getting caught out or a DOT is on you that you just can't get rid of, the Jade Elephant can reduce that damage to basically nilch. Or if you ever felt like hugging an imp and the imp is not very friendly, just turn this on and you'll still be able to forcefully hug them. The Jade Elephant is a perfect combination with a tank build and if you have enough gestures at the ground and some fuel cells, you'll be able to have the Jade Elephant up for a very long time. And that's it for the B tier, let's now go on to the A tier. Starting us out, we have the Disposable Missile Launcher, one of my favorite equipments to find in Risk of Rain 2. A Disposable Missile Launcher will fire a swarm of 12 missiles that deal 12 times 300% damage on a 45 second cooldown. Each individual missile actually has a proc coefficient of 1.0 making it really good when paired with a bunch of on-hit items. One of my favorite builds to run with this is the Jester of the Drown with several fuel cells, so the equipment cooldown is about 10 seconds on it, then running Soulbound Catalyst for an infinite loop. The game gets really fun once you get a ceremonial dagger and you're basically wiping the whole map without even having to lift a finger. The only reason that this is A tier and not S tier is because it requires a lot of setup for it to be as powerful as I would like it to be, but it still isn't a bad item. Next we have the Foreign Fruit which instantly heal for 50% of your maximum health on a 45 second cooldown. In terms of healing equipment, this is the best healing equipment in the game as it heals you for 50% of your maximum health, aka it scales with your maximum health. The 50% is about 5 times the Gnarled Wood Sprite, the only downside being that you have a 45 second downtime. I wouldn't recommend running Gesture of the Drown with Foreign Fruit as you're going to want to determine the time to use your 50% heal. Next up we have the Preon Accumulator which I believe is A tier, fires Preon Tendrils zapping enemies with 35 meters up to 600% damage per second on contact detonate an enormous 20 meter explosion for 4000% damage with a whopping 140 second cooldown. Now, you're probably wondering why this item which does so much damage is A tier and not S tier. Well, there are two reasons. First, the cooldown is massive. 140 seconds is a little over 2 minutes. Even stacking a Gesture of the Drowned, you're still waiting a minute between cooldown. And that's without saying that the Gesture of the Drowned will make you use your Prey on any time it comes off cooldown, which might not be advantageous. And also, though the Preon Accumulator is strong, there is going to be a point in the game where the Preon will not be able to kill an enemy. And an item with a 140 second cooldown, which means that you'll be without it for another 2 minutes and 20 seconds, not being able to kill an enemy is pretty disastrous. A good item, yes, but there is still better. And finally, in the A tier for the equipment, you have the Supermassive Leech. The Supermassive Leech will heal for 20% of the damage you deal, lasts for 8 seconds with a 60 second cooldown. This is the only item item in the game of its kind where it will heal you based off of the damage you deal which is usually pretty hefty. After you use the Supermassive Leech one time, you'll be able to fill your HP bar as much as you like. The only one real downside to this item being that you have to be doing the damage for it to heal you. If you're ever in a pinch, say you got froze by a Glacier Elite's death animation thing, and you need health like right now, you like you can't turn around, you can't hit anything, you just need health right now, the Supermassive Leech will not save you. One of the best lifesteal items in the game, and once paired with Aegis or various other items like Nehukana's, this could be absolutely insane. So definitely A tier and borderline S tier if you have the right items with you. Alright now let's move on to the S tiers and we'll be going over the best equipment in the game. So for starters let's start with the Recycler. My favorite S tier item, transfer an item or equipment into a different one can only be converted into the same tier one time. Basically how the Recycler works is if there is an item of a certain rarity and you would like to recycle it, you can recycle it and it will randomly turn it into a different item of that exact same rarity but it can never be the same item that you recycled it from. So that's probably confusing, let me just make an example real quick. Let's say you found a Cautious Slug from a chest and you want to recycle it. A Cautious Slug is a white item which means that the recycled item will always end up being a white item. Also because it was a Cautious Slug to begin with, it won't be recycled into another Cautious Slug. So whenever you are recycling an item, realize that it will not be that item and realize that it will always be of the same rarity of the item that you're recycling. My favorite thing to do with the Recycler is to make items from nothing. Let's say you have a bunch of scrap and you have not found a printer yet but you still want to get rid of the scrap because it's been several stages and you're just not finding good items. With the recycler you can turn any 3D printer into a free item machine. Maybe you ended up using a shrine of order and you have 50 lens makers glasses. 
Even if it's an inferior 3D printer to go to, you could go to any 3D printer and recycle for free items. So let's say it was a fresh meat printer, then you could put in your lens baker's glasses into the fresh meat printer, and whenever it pops out a fresh meat, you could recycle it into a different item. You're basically guaranteed anything but a fresh meat, which makes the 3D printer pretty good. Also, you can stack fuel cells with the recycler to give yourself as many recycles as you have fuel cells. Just keep in mind that you cannot recycle the same item more than once, so you can only recycle one item one time. Also, do note that if you use the gesture of the drowned, I do not believe that you can use the recycler. I've tried it a couple times and either I've just been doing it wrong or it's bugged, but I have not been able to use the recycler with gesture of the drowned. But whenever you see a recycler in a chest or anywhere else, pick it up immediately, even over such items like the Preon or the Royal Capacitor, because this can give you free other items. You'll never know the feeling of recycling a frost relic into a brilliant behemoth or ceremonial daggers until you use the recycler. It's really powerful. Powerful. Being able to turn dead runs into god runs is just insane, and this allows you to turn the RNG into your favor. Anyway, let's move on. The next S tier item is the Royal Capacitor. The Royal Capacitor calls down a lightning strike on a targeted monster, dealing 300% damage and stunning nearby monsters. It does this on a amazing 20 second cooldown. The Royal Capacitor is the best damage equipment in the game of Risk of Rain 2, and this is because 1 it has 3000% damage on a single target, but also it has a 20 second cooldown. This means with just one Jester of the Drowned and nothing else, you'll have a 10 second cooldown on something with a 3000% damage. Also, the Royal Capacitor has a 1.0 proc coefficient which makes it very likely for it to proc an item. Imagine an ATG missile proccing on a Royal Capacitor hit which deals 3000% damage. That would make the ATG missile that procs from the Royal Capacitor deal 9000% damage, and that's math. Also, because the Royal Capacitor needs a target to fire, it works extremely well with the Gesture of the Drown in not being wasted. So if you never look at an enemy with the Royal Capacitor and the Gesture of the Drowned, you'll always have the Royal Capacitor ready, allowing you to effectively save up your Royal Capacitor charges and only use it on enemies that you want to use it on, while still gaining the benefit of the 50% CDR of the Gesture of the Drowned. In my opinion, the Royal Capacitor is the best equipment in the game because its cooldown is so low, its damage is so high, and it's so easy to work with other items. It's just an all around really, really, really powerful equipment. If you ever see a Royal Capacitor, pick it up over everything else, only exception being the Recycler and only sometimes, as the Royal Capacitor can carry you through a game regardless of your items. Alright, now let's move on to the Lunar items. I'm just going to spit these out randomly because there's only a couple of them, so I'm going to go down the list. Starting off with the Effigy of Grief, this is a C tier item, all characters within are slowed by 50% and have their armor reduced by 20, can place up to 5. Effigy of Grief recently got a buff which makes it so that you don't actually have to put it down at your feet and you can actually toss it at enemies, so you're not always going to be affected by the Effigy of Grief's AoE debuff. Previously this was a F tier item because it would debuff you and it would be incredibly hard to escape the AoE once you're in it. Now it's not bad if you end up seeing it on the floor, which is unlikely as it is a lunar item. I would avoid it still, but it's still got its uses. Next we have the Glowing Meteorite, which is an F tier item. Glowing Meteorite spawns meteors from the sky, damaging all characters for 600% damage per blast and lasts for 20 seconds with a 140 second cooldown. The thing about this item is, is that it hurts you and all of your allies, so it's pretty bad. The blasts spawn pretty randomly, and sometimes it feels like they're targeting you more than they're targeting enemies, so I would just go without getting this item. That being said, if you're in a multiplayer match with your friends and you have a glowing meteorite plus a gesture of the drown maybe a couple of fuel cells that's that's some fun that's some fun you can have right there next up we have the hellfire tincture which is a c but an a if you are stacking razor wire Hellfire Tincture will ignite all characters within 15 meters, deals 5% of your maximum health per second as burning to yourself, the burn is 0.5x stronger on allies, and 24 times stronger on enemies. It's kind of like the Frost Relic AoE, except much larger, so I would actually call this better than Frost Relic in some cases. However, you don't want to be slowly ticking down your health if you're not a survivor that can take advantage of the AoE. So, unless you're a melee survivor, or you're stacking enough Razor Wire that the Razor Wire will proc on any enemies nearby, I recommend avoiding the Hellfire Tincture. And finally for the Lunar Equipment we have Spinal Tonic which is A tier. 
Spinal Tonic will allow you to drink it, gaining a boost for 20 seconds, increases damage by 100%, increases attack speed by 70%, armor by 20, maximum health by 50%, and passive health regeneration by 300%, and finally, boost speed by 30%. This has a 60 second cooldown, and when the tonic wears off, you have a 20% chance to gain a tonic affliction, reducing all of your stats by minus 5%. The one thing about the spinal tonic is as long as the tonic is effective, you are not affected by the tonic affliction. Which means if you have a 100% uptime on the spinal tonic, you will never have to take the chance of having spinal affliction on you. So this item is only A tier when you have a 100% uptime, otherwise it is probably F tier. This is because it can reduce all of your stats, including your damage stats, which reduces effectiveness of a bunch of items, and can reduce all of your other stats as well, so if you have a Tonic Affliction, you're basically just hurting yourself. As long as you have a Gesture of the Drown and 3 Fuel Cells, you will never be afflicted by the Tonic Affliction, because you'll have 100% uptime. One very large caveat to this item is that if you go on the Engineer, your turrets copy your Afflictions, which means that even if you have 100% uptime on your Spinal Tonic, they will copy your Afflictions, but not the active from the spinal tonic meaning that they will lose their stats and not be able to gain them back so avoid this at all costs on the engineer as it just kind of debuffs you okay that's it for the lunar items now we're going to go over the elite equipment real quick this is the last part and this is it so when there are elite equipment in the game these drop very very rarely from elite enemies that you kill Basically, every single one of them is hot garbage, except the Silence Between Two Strikes. That is the only one that is non-garbo. But even still, you should avoid these at all costs as they take an equipment slot, and you'd much rather have any other form of equipment other than just becoming an elite enemy. We've got Wake of Vultures for that, okay? Anyway, that's it for the guide. That's it for the item tier list. That's it. There's no other items in the game. If you like it, make sure to leave a like. If you want to see more like this, you know, subscribe. I can't believe I made it this long. I actually hate myself. This is going to take forever to edit. Oh my lord. Oh god. Follow me over on Twitch TV slash RND Thursday if you would like to. I stream there sometimes. Not all the time. Just sometimes. And if you have any questions, leave a comment down below. I try to respond to all of them. It's really hard now because there are more people. So I'll try my best, but I can't make any promises anymore. Anyways, thanks for watching and I hope you have a good day. See ya.